Hello and welcome back to PC Retro Programmer. This video is another in our series on advanced CGA graphics programming where we try to uncover the secrets of the IBM CGA graphics card that was used in the original IBM PC. Now, one of the projects I've been working towards in this series is something called a linearly addressed graphics mode. And it hasn't been achieved on the IBM CGA card yet, and so we don't really know whether it's possible. It's a very interesting technical exercise. Now, the details of linearly addressed graphics modes don't matter for this video. If you want to check them out, there's some videos on the channel about that. Uh, but what does matter in this video is that in order to pull that mode off, we're going to need very precise control of the chip on the IBM CGA card, the CRT controller chip. We've already figured out we'll need to write directly to registers on that chip instead of using the IBM CGA BIOS uh, using interrupts. And, uh, but unfortunately, writing these registers also comes with some issues. Uh, first of all, uh, we might have a very short period of time to do these writes. Uh, you can write the registers any time you want, but for the particular effects that we need, uh, we actually have to do quite a number of register writes after the end of the active region of a scanline. So the active region is the portion where pixels are being displayed, and then there's a gap as the electron beam scans to the right-hand side of the screen, uh, retraces back to the left-hand side, and then moves across to where the next scan line starts. And that gap is not a particularly long period of time, and it may happen that we need to do quite a number of register writes in this gap. And we may have just about enough time to do all the register writes we need, but there are some issues. First of all, we don't really know when that gap actually starts. There is a status register that we can monitor, and it has a bit that will tell us when the end of the active region comes. But a loop for polling that register is so long that by the time we actually get the answer at the end of the loop, uh, we don't really know exactly when the status bit changed. And in addition, it may already be too late to fit in all the register writes that we need before the end of the scan line. Uh, so that's not really going to be precise enough. And the other issue is that the machine's quite noisy. There's interrupts interrupting the CPU all the time. And there's also dynamic RAM refresh going on, which interferes with the bus and uh, that interferes with any memory accesses that we need to do. So uh, all of this is problematic. Uh, it means that we don't have really precise control at all uh, where our register writes happen. In today's video, I'm gonna show the problem by writing some code using the programmable interval timer to set up a loop that's exactly as long as a CRT frame in time, uh, right down to the cycle. But when we try to uh, do some change at exactly the same point uh, every frame, we'll discover that it actually moves about all over the place. Uh, there's some jitter, and it's to do with these problems that I've just described. So in subsequent videos in the series, we'll try and eliminate these sources of jitter one by one until we get down to perfect control, down to the pixel of when our registers actually get written. Now, I've already mentioned that in today's video, we're going to use the programmable interval timer, the PET, which is the Intel 8253 chip in the IBM PC, to fire off an interrupt at exactly the same point every CRT frame. You probably remember that the CRT monitor runs at about 60 hertz, and so we're going to need an interrupt to fire off about 60 times a second. In fact, we'll compute the exact number of PET cycles for a counter, which will count down to zero and then fire off an interrupt and then repeat. Uh, so uh, the pit actually has three different counters. Uh, counter zero is normally used for the system timer for the date and time. And that's the one we're gonna co-opt because it's the one that can fire off an interrupt. Counter one is normally used for DRAM refresh and counter two for the PC speaker, by the way, on the PC. And the way that you control these is using four registers. Here's the port addresses for those. Uh, the mode command register has a byte which specifies how the counter should operate and which counter you're actually using. 
Uh, so as I said, we'll use counter zero and uh, counter zero's data port is here. And this is where we specify the count value. Uh, so uh, this is a 16 bit count, uh, but only an eight bit port. So you have to write this twice to specify the whole count value. So let's take a look at how we'd set this mode command register up to make this work. So we're going to be using channel zero counter. Uh, so that means we put zero in bits six and seven. Uh, we'll specify the 16 bit count value as a low byte followed by a high byte uh, written to this port, of course. And so that means we put the value three in bits four and five. Uh, you're supposed to be able to modify the low byte and high byte separately, but uh, this doesn't work for me and I've had someone else confirm this. So uh, there may be something going on there. Uh, there's also a latch, but that's used for reading. You don't want the value to be changing while you're trying to read the two bytes. So uh, that's what that's for, but we won't need that today. And then there's a mode. Uh, we'll be using mode two, which I'll talk about in a moment. And finally, there's a bit zero, which I missed here. Uh, that actually specifies whether you're gonna use a binary value or binary coded decimal value for the counter. And uh, the binary coded decimal can only get, go up to 9999, which is not high enough for us. In fact, I don't know anyone who uses this feature, so bit zero is almost always just left as a zero. Uh, so for the modes, mode zero looks like it could be the right thing. This fires an interrupt when it reaches a count of zero, but it only does it once and then sits and waits for you. We want something that repeats. Uh, modes one and five are hardware triggered and that would need something connected to the gate input uh, for the channel and there isn't anything connected to the gate input of channel zero on the PC so they're not going to be useful to us either. Uh, four is a software trigger but again it only does it once and then waits for you. Uh, two and three are the only ones that are going to repeat. Now the difference is mode two does a brief pulse when it finishes and uh, the square wave basically just alternates high, low, high, low. And that's used for the PC speaker, of course. We're gonna use the rate generator. Now uh, this will then fire off an interrupt every time it reaches a count of zero and it'll just restart again. And so we'll get an interrupt regularly at equally spaced intervals. Now, when it fires an interrupt, it uses interrupt request line zero, which goes directly to the CPU. And whenever the CPU gets a request along one of these lines, it looks up in a table in, right at the beginning of memory for the address of a handler to handle that interrupt. So IRQ zero actually corresponds to interrupt eight and so at the interrupt eight location in the table is the address of a handler. And we're gonna modify that address to point to our own handler. So instead of calling the usual system timer code, uh, it's gonna call our code instead. Uh, so that's how we're gonna take control of this timer. So that's how it all works. Uh, let's take a look at some code that does this in practice. This is jitter1.asm and you can find a link in the description for the repository if you want the code. Now we're gonna modify the interrupt vector table to point to our own handler for interrupt eight. In order to do that, we need to save the address of the old handler so it can be restored before we go back to DOS. And so I just allocate a couple of words in our data segment to store this address. Uh, the other thing that we need to be careful of is if we run the program from the floppy drive, the floppy motor will still be running and it will just keep running uh, while this program is going uh, unless we wait for it to turn off first. And uh, DOS will get really messed up if we don't do this. So I've written some code for doing that. Uh, basically it looks in the BIOS data area, which is where the system keeps track of whether the motors are on or off. And the bias data area is at segment 040 hexadecimal and offset 03F is the status of the floppy motors. There could be more than one floppy drive and there's four bits that we need to look at. When they're all zero, uh, all the motors are off. So we do that at the very beginning of our program.
Now, what this program is going to do is it's going to very briefly change the background color to a bright red and then immediately back to black again uh, every time our interrupt is run. And so hopefully that'll happen at the same point every frame and should end up looking like it's in exactly the same position on the screen every frame. Uh, as we'll find out, uh, it's actually going to have a little bit of jitter in it though, and that's exactly what we're trying to demonstrate uh, in today's video. So for this, we're going to go into CGA mode 4, that's the graphics mode, and uh, we'll have to modify the interrupt vector table to point to our handler for interrupt 8. Uh, in order to modify the table, uh, we don't want it to be in use, so we have to turn the interrupts off uh, temporarily. And uh, then we put the segment address for the interrupt vector table, uh, which is right at the beginning of memory, so it has segment address 0 into our data segment, uh, so we can access it. And we read out the existing handler offset and segment address. And we'll just put them in registers for now, and in a moment we'll store those in those data variables that we allocated uh, at the top of the program. Uh, so now we're going to write in the offset and segment for our handler, and our handler is called IRQ0 handler, you'll see it in a moment. And uh, the segment address for that is just going to be our current code segment address. Uh, so we put those into the table. Now interrupt 8 uh, is at address 8 times 4 in the interrupt vector table. That's because each uh, interrupt vector consists of a segment and an offset address, uh, each of which is a word, so it's a total of 4 bytes each. Uh, so that's how we compute the address for interrupt 8 in the table. And uh, we just restore our data segment register back to uh, its original value, which just happens to be the same as a CS register in tiny memory mod model. Uh, so finally, we're going to write those uh, old handle offset and segment addresses into those memory variables. Uh, now the next thing we want to do is to uh, figure out where the start of the active region is. And uh, this happens actually at the beginning of every scan line. Uh, so we want the first time that happens. And a neat way of doing that is to first wait for vertical sync, which is right at the bottom of the screen, and then wait for the first time that display enable bit is set. And that'll correspond to the very start of the very first scan line of the frame. Uh, so we do this by looking at the CJ status register, which is at port 3DA. And uh, if we look at bit 3 of that, that tells us about the vertical sync. And if we look at bit 0, that tells us about the display enable. So now we know we're right at the very beginning of the CRT frame. Uh, I've tried putting a little delay in here just to move the thing a little bit further across to the right. Uh, just waited a little bit more in time, uh, so we're not quite at the very beginning of the frame. Uh, this didn't quite work the way I thought, as you'll see, but uh, anyway, that was what the no-ops were for. The next thing we need to do is to set up our counter on channel 0 of the pet. Uh, so uh, if you go through all of those values that we need in the mode command register that I already discussed, uh, that comes out to a value of 3, 4 hexadecimal, and we just write that to the mode command register at uh, port 4, 3. And the count value that we're going to use is the exact number of pit cycles for a CRT frame. Uh, so let's figure out exactly what this has to be. Now the calculations for all this are on the left hand side over here. Uh, there's a crystal in the machine that runs at 14.31818 MHz. Uh, they just used a commonly available NTSC crystal for this. And for the various bits of hardware, it's just divided down in different ways. So the CPU, for example, runs at one third of this frequency, which is 4.77 MHz. Uh, the CGA card actually gets this frequency directly and uses it for its dot clock. Uh, so basically every dot in high resolution mode is one tick of this oscillator's clock. And uh, in the medium resolution graphics mode, uh, it's basically two dots uh, per pixel. 
then the CRT controller chip on the CGI card is uh, 8 pixels per character. Remember this is a character device and so in the medium resolution mode this ends up being the CGA frequency divided by 16. Uh, then the programmable interval timer is this frequency divided by 12. Now uh, this frequency here is basically the character frequency and we know exactly how many characters on, on the screen. Uh, in the graphics mode there's 57 characters across the screen and there's 262 scan lines down the screen. Uh, that's a complete frame. And so it turns out that the number of pit cycles per frame is just this value uh, times 4 by 3. 4 by 3 being the ratio uh, of uh, this 16 divided by 12 here. Uh, so that's the comparison between pit cycles and a CRT uh, characters. Uh, and there are this many characters. It works out to 19,912 pit cycles exactly per frame. And so this is the value that we're going to use in our code. Now, of course, we need to break this 19,912 up into two bytes, a low byte and a high byte. And if you do the maths, it turns out that the low byte should have the value 200 and the high byte should have the value 77. So we write those uh, one at a time to port 040 hexadecimal, which is our channel zero data port. And uh, that sets the count for our timer. And now as soon as we turn the interrupts back on again, uh, our handler will get run every time this interrupt gets fired. And because we started this timer off right around the time where the start of the screen was, uh, it should end up occurring there every time at the same time every frame. So uh, let's just move down now to where our actual handler is. Uh, it's a little bit further down in the code here. Uh, so this is all just the code for exiting to DOS. Uh, now the interrupt handler is pretty straightforward. All it's going to do is change the background color uh, which is done using port 3D9H. Uh, this is uh, on the CGA card, this register. Uh, so we'll change it to color 12, which is a light red, and then immediately back to zero, which is black. Uh, now, an interrupt handler needs to be very careful about a few things. Any registers that you modify have to be saved. Uh, so we modified the AX and DX registers. And so we push and pop those. Uh, also, at the end of an interrupt handler, uh, we need to acknowledge the end of interrupt by sending uh, 020 hexadecimal uh, to the master pick controller and this is done by outputting it to port 020H and uh, that finishes off our handler and in, instead of doing a return uh, which is what you do if you were returning from an ordinary function we use this special IRAT instruction to return from an interrupt. Uh, so that's really all there is to it. Uh, so let's go up now and look at the rest of our code. And uh, basically, once that interrupt is enabled, uh, our handler is being run and uh, everything is going. Uh, what we need to now uh, exit to DOS. And the way we're gonna do that is we're gonna check for a key press. And when someone presses a key, we'll go back to DOS. Now, an easy way to check for a key is to use interrupt 16H and uh, function one will check if there's a key being pressed. Uh, so we just loop until the key is pressed, basically. Uh, remember the interrupts are just running uh, autonomously in the background. We don't need to do anything here. We can run whatever code we want here. Uh, so the only code we need to run is just a loop to check for keys being pressed. Uh, once it's pressed, we need to get the actual key press uh, from the buffer. And this is done using function zero of interrupt 16H. And uh, finally, we can uh, restore back the original interrupt handler and exit to DOS uh, once that key is pressed. So this is just uh, basically the same code in reverse.
Uh, we take our values, uh, which we stored in memory, put them back into registers. Uh, we set up the segment address for the interrupt vector table, write the old hand row addresses back into the table. And uh, then we run code here for uh, changing our timer value back to the maximum possible value. And this is the value that DOS uses uh, for the system timer. Uh, so then we enable interrupts again, everything's back to normal. Uh, we can go back into text mode and exit to DOS. Uh, so that's all there is to it. Uh, so let's run this program and actually see what happens. Now in order to show this running, I'm using a program called Marty PC. And this should be cycle accurate as far as the CPU is concerned, and it's pretty good for the CGA card as well. Uh, it can't emulate absolutely everything 100% perfectly, but all the basic stuff that we do uh, certainly works okay. And in fact, uh, you know, even demos like uh, 8088 MPH and Area 5150 run perfectly on Marty PC. So let's run our code and see what it looks like. And you can see that after a little bit of settling down, uh, it ends up roughly at the beginning of the frame, but it's got a lot of jitter in it. And this is to do with uh, the interrupts that I was talking about and uh, the uh, DRAM refresh. And also, every time I run this code, it'll end up in a slightly different place just because I don't know precisely where the frame starts uh, using the code that I have written. Uh, so all of these problems we'll try and solve in a future video and get this rock solid. Now, I know that there might be some people watching this who are a little bit confused at this point, thinking, well, surely it can't be this hard to draw pixels on the screen in CGI mode. And of course, normally it's not. You just put data into video RAM for this and let the CGI card uh, deal with putting things on the screen at the same place every frame. What I'm doing here is a little bit different. I'm changing the background color register at a very specific time in the frame. And uh, this is something that is really timing dependent. Uh, it takes effect as soon as I write that register. And this is quite different to just putting values in the video RAM. And for a lot of really advanced effects, uh, this is the sort of thing that you need to be doing. Uh, so, at any rate, uh, in the next few videos, we'll try and get this uh, rock solid uh, so it doesn't move about at all.